Amen. I didn't think that we would be able to convince Jeff to join the faculty of the Bear Valley Bible Institute. Sent him an email, asked him uh, what he could think about that, and gave him some of the parameters of uh, the time frame and so on. And uh, to our amazement and excitement, uh, Jeff said yes. Jeff is one who was graduated summa cum laude from Freed Hartman, received a Master of Science degree in Physical Science, earned a Master of Science and a PhD degree in Biomechanical Engineering uh, from uh, Auburn University. He is one that is uh, most noted for the work that he does with Apologetics Press. Uh, he serves as a full-time science writer for College Edge Press, associate editor of the publication uh, that they they produced, Reason and Revelation, as, as well as editor of the AP Bible Class Curriculum. He's also an author, having uh, authored a book entitled Science versus Evolution. Jeff is eminently qualified to be a speaker on this particular lectureship. We were so, so thrilled, man. Uh, he was able to uh, fit this lectureship in uh, to his busy time uh, schedule and be a part of this program. And so, Jeff, we'll turn it over to you. So, I, uh, I get four hours whenever I teach Christian evidences. Um, so, I just assume I can keep rolling here at this point in time. And then I heard I only get 40 minutes, so I figured I got kind of dipped on that. <laughs> All right, I'm not seeing the problem. Are you? Let's turn the door. Give them a minute here to do that. There we go. Topic today, Christian evidence. This is crucial. It's crucial for churches to spend time studying this today and exploring the evidences for uh, Christianity. Uh, of course, we've got several passages in the Bible that emphasize the importance of making sure that we are ready to defend the truth and uh, being teachers in this subject, being able to give a defense. All right, so the question is. What does that mean today here in the 21st century? Being ready uh, to defend the truth, it really it means something different in the first century when, when Peter and Paul and so forth were, were penning these words. Uh, so what do, I, what do I mean by that? Well, at least some of the questions that the Bible writers were dealing with were different from those that we're facing today, were they not? They were dealing, for example, with Jews who were attempting to bring Judaism into Christianity. They were dealing with uh, Gnostics and, and Greek philosophers. They were dealing with people who uh, denied the actual bodily resurrection of Christ. They were dealing with polytheism uh, from the pagans around them. They were dealing with the ever-increasing Roman threat. And, you know, and all of these can still be relevant to us since we can Blame principles that are still relevant to us today, but notice many of the specific questions that they were asking aren't really facing the church specifically today. Okay, so fast forward to today. If Paul and Peter and so forth were writing by inspiration today, would they have likely addressed those same subjects if they weren't as relevant to us today in 21st century America? Or might they have addressed other issues, uh, the issues that are prominent ones facing the church today? Well, we can, we can guess that they would, because that's what they were doing then, by inspiration. They were responding to the issues that Christians and the church were facing, many of which, of course, are still relevant today. Well, what are we dealing with today in 21st century America? What do we, uh, the church, have to be ready to defend what are, what are the biggest threats to Christianity today? Well, certain ones are the same, of course, that they were dealing with, but perhaps some of those are even more of an issue than they were back then, 
uh, and others might be less. You know, would, would they address pluralism today? Is this a major problem, the promotion of diverse religious views, putting them on equal footing in our country? Uh, would they address the, the threat from denominationalism, which notice didn't even exist back then, at least in the form we see it today? Now, materialism, that's still an issue, but it's probably even more so in our country due to our prosperity. All right, now what about atheism? This was less of an issue in the first century, perhaps. Uh, the Romans and Greeks were poly polytheistic. The Jews, of course, were theistic. But what about today in America? You know, imagine lining up 10 of the youth from your congregation across the, the front of the auditorium here. And try to picture 10 of your youth. Now you got your shy ones, and some of them are being hams. All right, so now according to Statistician, member of the church, Dr. Flavor Yagley, 40% of those will fall away when they leave home. Four out of ten of them, two out of five of the young people in the church are leaving the church upon, upon going off to college. Right? Does that concern you? Okay, important question. Why are they leaving? Is that not something we need to know about and prepare for in the church? Is this not a question we need to be asking? Do we have our finger on the pulse of the church as, as we should? Now, of those 40% that leave, statistics show that half of those will join denominations. All right, now, do you think that's a, a good reason to be sure to educate our membership and youth about denominationalism and even spend a good amount of time on that subject? Sure. And both denominationalism as well as liberalism, which, of course, is a mentality which ultimately leads to denominationalism. All right, now, we can't know with certainty, of course, but I'd imagine that, that Peter and Paul and the others would have addressed those subjects if they were writing today. They would have addressed a threat that is significant enough that it is pulling 20% of our youth away when they leave home. Now, according to the statistics, the other 20% are becoming totally irreligious when they leave home. They leave religion. Some of those are so wrapped up in materialism they just don't have time for church. But a high percentage of that 20% are citing science matters, naturalism as the reason for their departure. So that is, things that they learned in science, for example, shook their faith in what they had been taught at church and home. And really their faith was more than shaken, it was destroyed. They left the church. All right, now again, is that something that's important to know about today? Is this something that's important to address? Is it something that's important to prepare ourselves to deal with? Now the typical reasons given to the surveyors are that the young people learned about evolution in college. Uh, they came to disbelieve in miracles because they were taught naturalism while they were growing up and in college. They believe that there's a lack of evidence for God and for Christianity, for the Bible, they believe that Christianity even goes against logic and common sense. A new Gallup poll from last year reveals an ominous trend here. Biblical creation is trending downward, and naturalism continues to steadily rise in our country. Roughly one in five Americans now accept naturalism. I think about that. You know, gone are the days where you would be sitting in a classroom and, and None of your friends were atheists. Maybe two to three percent of Americans were atheistic in their thinking. We're talking one in five now. Technically, nineteen percent now accept pure naturalistic evolution. So the poll indicated that by graduation from college, the percentage of naturalists among those graduates climbs twelve percent. The number of theistic evolutionists more than doubles. It climbs nineteen percent. Whereas the number of creationists plummets from 48% down to 21%. Alright, so basically America is leaving the Bible and becoming more and more naturalistic, more and more evolutionary. College professors and influences are capturing the minds of our youth. So again, if we're going to obey the commands to be ready to give a defense of the 21st century, it is important to know that information, is it not? But does it surprise us that really these are the numbers that, that, would, that this would be the case, what we're seeing? 87% of the youth in America are in the public school system, and the official doctrine that is taught 
is naturalism. Right? God's been pulled out. So that is some form of evolution that is used to explain where we came from. And so it should be no surprise then that a high percentage of the church is leaving the church over that issue. Now I know some members of the church that really see no time to spend time, no reason to spend time on the subject of Christian evidences. And by implication, they see no need to be prepared to teach others Christian evidences. Now this, this is unnecessary, what we're doing this week in that sense. You know, my friends, that is the main problem. And it's certainly the case that we have to do. We have what we need in Scripture to know how to live life the way God wants us to. How to, how to live a godly life so you're with you. But that does not mean that we're not also supposed to be studying other things in order to fulfill other commands of God in Scripture. Some congregations though, don't seem to see a need to have Christian evidence of series and, and lectureships, seminars, to make sure that their membership not only has uh, their fundamentals shored up, but also that they can teach those things to others. So the mentality that, you know, we don't need to teach to study Christian evidence. Well, that concerns me because, number one, that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, the Bible teaches the importance of studying the created world, studying the great works of God, Psalm 112, uh, the things that are made, Romans 120, which point to God. Scripture tells us that we can study the universe and learn about God, Genesis 15, 5, Psalm 19, 1, Job 38, 41, uh, Job 12, 8. Uh, scripture teaches us to test all things, hold fast what is good, 1 Thessalonians 5, 21. Which includes scientific ideas which challenge the truth, like evolution. So, by implication, Christians today have to study a bit of science to make sure we're ready to deal with naturalists, which is based in science, naturalism. A growing number of individuals in our country. The Bible also teaches the importance of responding to people who challenge the faith. We're supposed to be ready to defend the truth, contend earnestly for the faith. So the mentality that says we should only study our Bible, that's not even what the Bible teaches. So that mentality concerns me. But another thing that concerns me about it is that it is self-centered. Now the person who argues that we don't need Christian evidence is, is only thinking about himself. Here, here's what I mean about that. The mentality that I've heard with some goes something like this. You know, I was able to come to believe God and the Bible without learning Christian evidences. So everyone else can do So Christian evidences is pointless according to that mentality. All right, now granted, perhaps for, for many people, for most people, it may be the case that they don't need to have answers to challenges like evolution and the Big Bang and naturalism, and they're having that shoved down their throat day in and day out. But clearly that is not the case for many people, at least a high percentage of this remaining 20%. What about them? Is 20% not a significant number of people in the church? But shouldn't we be ready to give them an answer? And keep in mind, 20% are becoming irreligious, but that, that isn't including the other young people who would have fallen away, but did not because they were taught Christian evidences. They were given the answers that they needed, the science challenges that they were being presented at school with. They had wise elders and preachers and parents who gave them the tools and the knowledge that they needed in order to stay solid. So the statistics are showing that we're now to a time when doctrinal issues and denominationalism are not a hands-down dominant issue that the church has to be ready to deal with today, as it has been in times past. Those are still crucial, don't get me wrong. But now we have another issue that's just as important. Being ready to deal with naturalism. Making sure that we're ready with answers to the challenges that are being levied against Christians today. Naturalists have control of the science classroom and they routinely make pot shots of biblical creation. The students can't help but soak up. Uh, Michael Shermer, very popular, a skeptic, he says, intelligent design creationists have no science to speak of. He says, if creationists want their doctrines taught in public school science classes, they need first to develop a science and then to convince scientists that their scientific ideas merit inclusion based on the quality arguments and evidence. So kids are being taught from a young age 
The biblical creation isn't scientific. It's silly, and it's an idea that should be scoffed at. Creationists aren't scientific, unlike the naturalists. And creationists don't have evidence for what they believe, unlike the naturalists. Notice what Sherman says here. For creationists to disprove evolution, they need to unravel all these independent lines of evidence, which he talks about in this book, as well as construct a rival theory that can explain them better than the theory of evolution. They have yet to do so. All right, so we have to deal with the evidence for evolution, which we do and have, and see our website at Holland Express for that. And then actually build our own model by laying out the evidence that undergirds Christianity and the Bible, that supports it, showing the evidence for Christianity. What we're going to do today is we can. Christian evidences. Well, we have, of course, met Schirmer's challenge. We can dismantle evolution, and we can do so systematically. And we do that in the Christian evidences course here at Bear Valley. And we also have to do the opposite, and we do so. Systematically construct a creation model based on the available, notice, evidence. Evidence. Christianity is first and foremost a religion based on evidence. Evidence is important to God, and so it should be important to us. God doesn't want us to blindly believe in anything. Notice what the law of rationality says in philosophy should only draw those conclusions that are warranted by the evidence. In other words, only believe what you can substantiate with proof. This is a biblical idea. Examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, or test all things, hold fast to what is good. God does not want us to blindly believe that he exists. He expects us to weigh the evidence and come to the right conclusion from that evidence, to know the truth that will set us free, John 8, 32. Remember the Bereans? They didn't just blindly believe what they were being taught when they do. They searched the scriptures to make sure what they were being taught was accurate. Acts 17 11. We should, we should just believe everything we hear, but we should test the spirits, to make sure they're of God. First John 4 1. Because many false prophets have gone out of the world. Jesus actually told his audience to not believe him if he didn't substantiate his claims with actual evidence. John 10. 37. Biblical faith in God is not blind. It's not a blind belief, hoping that there's someone at the bottom to catch you. That would be what is defined as fideism. According to Miriam Webster Dictionary, this is reliance on faith rather than reason and pursuit of religious truth. Notice that modern dictionaries pit faith against reasoning and evidence, because that's what the bulk of the religious world has come to believe about the nature of faith. But that's not what the Bible teaches on this subject. Biblical faith is the same kind of trust that you would have in anybody that's based on evidence. It's been substantiated. Somebody has proven themselves to be trustworthy. If you have trust in a parent or friend, it's based on evidence, for example. Romans chapter 1 and verse 20 is perhaps the premier passage that would highlight major form of evidence that God has given us that points to his existence. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made. If you look at the things that are made, come to the conclusion that God exists, and even come to know certain things about the nature of God without even having a Bible. It doesn't matter what country you're in, even if you've never seen a Bible, you can come to know there's a God and certain things about that God by merely Studying creation, in other words, basically doing science. If a person is going to be to try to build the creation model in a systematic way for a naturalist who demands scientific evidence, he's going to need to do all of these things. And again, the Bear Valley students do this in our course. So logically, a person is going to need to start by proving that a God must exist. That's what I want to spend some time introducing with my remaining time. The existence of God topic is going to be expounded upon way more thoroughly throughout the weekend. So this is going to be merely a survey of the topic uh, for the rest of this hour. So in studying the created order over the centuries, humans have reasoned through the evidence and articulated many excellent philosophical arguments that all point to the conclusion that there must be a God. These are arguments which have stood the test of time and have never been disproven. Uh, Blair Scott, American atheists said, inserting these classical arguments for the existence of God, 
The deal on targets have not changed much over thousands of years. He meant that as a jab, a jab, a scoff. Remember, he was uh, debating Kyle Butt and made this comment. But plus, Mark, he's actually right. Plus, arguments haven't changed much because the truth doesn't need to change. Possible arguments have, have stood the test of time. They've never been refuted, and that is significant. So consider, for example, the moral argument. Humans intuitively know that right and wrong exist. Objective moral value that isn't based on human opinion. Right and wrong, that we all understand is right and wrong for everyone in every location, every time. So an objective system of morality, however, that is above humanity cannot have been made by humanity. So by implication, there must be a moral being above humanity that created morality. In February 1998, William Grobine was professor of evolutionary biology at Cornell. He laid out several of the undeniable implications of the atheistic worldview in his speech. Notice number three on his list. According to the naturalistic or atheistic evolutionary model, no ultimate foundation for ethics exists. If you prefer pure naturalist, there is no such thing as an ultimate foundation for ethics. And notice also that he, he even said Charles Darwin understood that perfectly. Remember, he was developing modern evolutionary thinking. French makes a list of philosophy, John Paul Sartre, that says, Everything is indeed permitted if God does not exist. See, if there is no God, there is no higher being that can give absolute law that everyone is subject to. There's just opinions. And there are people that are stronger than others that can enforce their opinions on others. Now the problem with that rationale is that we know that there is an objective set of values that, that is above mere opinion. It doesn't matter what culture or setting a person grows up in, we understand from a young age, even if we haven't been taught about it, that there is right and wrong. We know that it, that it wouldn't be right, it wouldn't be fair, if another person came and took something from me that isn't his, that he hasn't worked for, or been given, or had first, we don't have to, to even be taught that. We just know it from a young age. That's not fair, we think. All right? We know, even if we're three years old, if I steal a cookie, and my sister does too, but I get in trouble and she doesn't, look, I know that's not right. right? It's not just. We all understand that, that it's not fair if you worked your whole life for something, somebody beats you up and takes it. It's not right, it's not fair. And it doesn't matter where you're from. We all understand the concept of justice. We recognize that injustice is objectively wrong, and so we intuitively understand that there's a higher law that governs everyone about fairness and justice, a moral law code above humans and not subject to our opinions. But there cannot be a higher law code that is above opinions of humanity without there being a lawmaker that wrote that law code. So objective morality illustrates there must be a God. That is the moral argument. The intuitional argument. Humans are incurably religious. Our intuition tells us there's a God. It seems to be common sense to humanity. It's as though we've been programmed to believe. According to Aaron some 92% of the world believes that there's something beyond the purely physical. 86% worship something, and the rest arguably worship themselves and each other. Animals don't do this, but humans seem to have been built with a desire to worship something. And atheism can't explain this apparent instinctive tendency of humanity. Shermer admitted, we perceive nature to be intelligently designed. Since the most common reason people give for why they believe in God is the good design of the world, intelligent design creationists are tapping into the intuitive understanding most people hold about life and the universe. So even the skeptics cannot deny that we intuitively believe. Why, if it is false, Richard Dawkins says, does every culture in the world have religion? True or false, religion is ubiquitous, so where does it come from? Psychologists Paul Bloom and Dean Weisberg at the University, University of Pennsylvania, respectively, they acknowledge there's by now a large body of research suggesting that humans are natural born creationists. When we see non random structure design, we assume that it was created by an intelligent being. So they've been discovering this in their studies in science. All right, so why is this a problem? 
Religion is so wasteful, so extravagant, Richard Dawkins said. And Darwinian selection habitually targets and eliminates waste. So if evolution is true, why wasn't religion eliminated? The animals still don't worship. The humans engage in this costly endeavor that should have worked against us from an evolutionary perspective and ultimately caused the demise of humans. Evolutionists are going to great lengths to try to explain why humans would be religious. For instance, Dawkins has irrationally proposed that religion may be something like a virus that has infected humanity and has been passed down genetically through what he calls memes. Now, the idea that theism is like a virus of the mind that tries to replicate itself for its own survival. And of course, the same arguments that are used in favor of memes by, by Dawkins and Dennett and others would be just as relevant to the atheistic mindset. Theism is a meme, why would atheism be a meme? So it doesn't, it's not going to fix the problem. Uh, you can see our book, uh, Positive Express, put out, Does God Exist? for a thorough discussion of that subject. So, bottom line, humanity seems to have been built to be religious, and it makes no sense from an evolutionary perspective. Our natural inclination to believe that there's something above us that we are beholden to and should worship is evidence that such a being exists and put that instinct within us, and I think that's what's being alluded to in Acts chapter 17. He's made from one blood every nation of men that dwell on the face of the earth, so that they should seek the Lord. He made us so that we would seek him, in the hope that they might grow for him and find him, though he's not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being. So he made us with instinct to automatically believe in him and made it easy to find him if you just look. So God has made us with this desire to grow with him. Human intuition indicates that God exists. The aesthetic argument, the fact that beauty exists, and that we've been given the capability of appreciating that. Atheism can adequately explain beauty, because that appreciation for beauty, by and large, has no evolutionary advantage. So this highlights the fact that a God exists who cares for his creation and wishes to give us joy and pleasure. Darwin recognized this argument as a fresh evolutionary theory in The Origin of Species. He said this, Some authors believe that many structures have been created for the sake of beauty, to the light and of the Creator, or for the sake of mere variety. Such doctrines, if true, would be absolutely fatal to my theory. All right, why? Well, because evolution can't explain how something would become beautiful for the sole benefit of others. See, evolution is survival of the fittest. It's, it's the selfish battle of the strong survival for survival. It's not about others. So evolving a trait has to have some kind of selfish benefit, not the benefit of others. So his argument was, okay, the beauty wasn't created. It just evolved accidentally. And the reason it stuck around, for example, in your beautiful male birds and so forth, was because that beauty benefited those creatures personally in getting mates. While uh, ugly animals didn't get those mates and they died out. All right, so the problems with that, number one, we have a lot of ugly creatures out there. <laughs> 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 the main arguments, though, Darwin's natural selection only helps to explain the survival of the fittest, not the arrival of the fittest. Evolution has no answer for how those creatures could have evolved the beauty in the first place. Mutations don't have new genetic information. You need new genetic information. So you've got to have some kind of way to create beauty. There is no known evolutionary mechanism for that. So mutations don't provide it, but new information would be needed to create beauty where there once was no beauty. But also notice that natural selection doesn't explain why we would have an innate appreciation of beauty in the first place. Why did you get joy and pleasure and happiness uh, merely from hearing beautiful music from an orchestra or seeing a waterfall or a sunset? While natural selection might try to explain why something beautiful tends to stick around, it doesn't explain why we see that thing as beautiful in the first place. Why do we have an appreciation for beauty? And therein lies an argument the existence of a loving God has made everything beautiful in its time, Ecclesiastes 3 11, things that are pleasant for the eyes, Ecclesiastes 11 7. The ontological argument, complicated argument to understand, heavy in philosophy, a 
I'm glad we got a good session on this this weekend. Uh, the idea is that you can't conceive of a quality or characteristic that doesn't exist in some meaning. Uh, so you make up something you've never seen in your mind, it's still composed of things that you know exist. So you make up a creature, you know, whatever. Um, Four-headed sea monster with snakes coming out of his eye sockets and fires coming out of his elbows. Right. So notice this creature is composed of things you've seen and know exist. Whether it be you know snakes and fire and elbows, you can't come up with something anything totally new, something comprised of qualities that you don't know already exist. Uh, Star Trek characters, for example, all composed of qualities that you know exist. The ontological argument says you can't conceive of something qualities that don't exist in some being. You can, however, conceive of superlative characteristics, omniscience, omnipotence, omnipresence, omnipotence, and so forth, indicating that they must exist in some being. All right, well, someone says, wait a minute, couldn't this just be an imaginary being with these imaginary characteristics? Well, no, let's think through that. So the characteristic were just imagined, just made it up, but it doesn't actually exist then it wouldn't be superlative, it wouldn't be the greatest. Because there would always be something even greater. But what would be greater? Well, if that characteristic were actually real, not just imagined, it would be greater. A real characteristic is superlative over imaginable. You can conceive of real superlative characteristics proving that those qualities or characteristics must exist in some being. And that is the thrust of the ontological argument then there's one of my favorites, the cosmological argument for the existence of God. Uh, the cosmos, the universe is here, had to come from somewhere. Uh, if we draw our conclusions based on the evidence, trying to be rational, then you must conclude that all material effects have causes. The universe is an effect, and so it demands a cause. Every house is, of course, built by someone. In other words, everything has a cause, including the universe. But the atheist says, well, wait a minute, you know, it doesn't really need a cause, it could create itself. But the first law of thermodynamics tells us that can't happen. Energy can be neither created nor destroyed, but can only be converted from one form to another, according to this law. So if the universe created itself, the matter and energy of the universe had to also create itself, which would violate this law, all of the evidence of uh, thermodynamics concerning this law. So this is a law which like all laws of science, has no exception. You cannot claim to be rational and believe the universe created itself by definition, because you have no evidence to support that. One cannot claim to be a naturalist. One cannot claim to be a naturalist and believe that something unnatural that violates a natural law happened. You're no longer a naturalist if you do that. You're now a supernaturalist, just like me. The question is which one of us actually has evidence to support our position. That's the question uh, that we'll be looking at for this weekend. Others argue that the universe wouldn't require a cause because it could have existed forever. Although this line of thought was once popular, uh, fewer scientists accept this today because of the implications of the second law of thermodynamics, which tells us that the universe is running down, it's moving towards disintegration, disorder, chaos, a state of complete heat death, of no usable energy. Well, that means that the universe could not have always existed and we still have usable energy. According to the second law of thermodynamics, if the universe is infinitely old, we should not have any usable energy. This implies there has to be a starting point for the universe. We have an abundant amount of usable energy in harmony with the biblical model, which argues that the universe is relatively young. Well, if the evidence indicates that matter and energy can create themselves or have existed forever, then that leaves one option. There's got to be something supernatural, something outside of the spirit of the natural realm that put the universe here, and the Bible uses the term God to describe that something. And finally, you have the teleological argument. Atheistic philosopher and professor Paul Ricci said, it's true that everything designed has a designer. You can't have a poem without there also being a what? A lit. A painting requires a painter. A fingerprint requires a finger. Yeah, it's a rocket science, right? <laughs> Does the universe contain the characteristic of design? Well, in fact, there's an infinite number of examples from nature that clearly show 
intention, purpose, design. And again, we're going to get to look at a lot of, like a lot of this over the weekend. I happen to know that because I got to hear what my dad's going to present, and others are doing so as well. And there's so many examples of design in the universe that notice what Schirmer said about it. The universe, the design inference comes naturally. The reason people think that a designer created the world is because it looks designed. <laughs> How about that admission? We perceive nature to be intelligently designed based on our experience of human artifacts. We know some human artifacts are intelligently designed because we have observed them being made and we have vast experience with human artifacts. Notice, we understand design, so we get a lot of evidence to understand when design is present. When we look out of the natural realm, we see design, therefore we infer there must be a designer of it. That is not blind faith to believe that. It's based on evidence. Recall what Sherbert said, since the most common reason people give for why they believe in God is the good design of the world, intelligent design creationists are tapping into the intuitive understanding that most people hold about life and the universe. So notice it's, it's intuitive to people, the fact that there is design in the universe. We could show a different number of examples of clear cut design of the universe, and some of those amazing evidences will be shown in other sessions uh, this week. This has never happened to me. I've got seven minutes left. This is beautiful. So that means I can go off script a little bit. All right, so let me tell you about uh, one, here's one, here's one area of design we can highlight. The atheists have no explanation for where the laws of science came from. Because every time you have a law, what do you have? A lawmaker, a lot every time. That's what the evidence says. Okay, so even if you can say the universe was created itself, nothing created something, you still have to explain where the laws that govern that come from. And so they come out and admit that we don't really know how that could happen. Um, so notice, laws of science are evidence of design that indicate there must be a designer. Uh, here's another one. Um, let's talk about your bladder for a moment. That was fun. <laughs> okay, so in your, in, your, in your brain, you've got your hypothalamus, it's kind of like your temperature, uh, your thermostat from your body's cooling system, okay? Okay, now, on the bladder, there is a muscle called the detrusor muscle. When the liquid within the bladder gets too cold, the bladder sends a message along what are called effector nerves, up to your hypothalamus in your brain. And I'm just going to say it's cool, it's getting too cold down there. So it sends a message back down and tells that detrusor muscle to contract, which makes you feel an urge to get the cold liquid out of your body. Right? All right, does that sound like something that just accidentally happened? Okay, so we're going to sit through that. Um, could you have a nerve that only went halfway down? I mean, how useful is that going to be? Notice it shows planning and intent and purpose. It's something that had to be in place from the very beginning in order for it to work right. The bladder is the truth or not. I'm using that one for the first time. I never use all my time in this four hour class. But these are students who are going to be taking this in the near future. It's an easy course, right? We don't learn anything more complicated. You get out early. It's not worry about it. Bottom line, there is a God. It's not a blind faith to accept that. It's a rational conclusion from the available evidence in both science and philosophy. And we've really only touched the human environment and relaying that evidence to you. Uh, so I very much appreciate your attention. Thank you, Jeff, very much. I was off to a, a great start. You know, it's so interesting that sometimes we hear these arguments and we see.